Hi guys, I think this is the first time you're ever hearing my voice, and it's kind of the first time I'm ever making a review, but I really want to do one for this movie because a lot of people keep asking me on my thoughts on To the Bone, and every time I say that I didn't like it, they're like, what? This is the best, you know, eating disorder film ever made, and it's like one of the worst eating disorder films ever made, and quick disclaimer, this is just my opinion. If you like this film, that's totally fine. You can like whatever you do like. This is just why I did not. And by the way, there will be spoilers, obviously. If you haven't seen the film by now, you're probably not going to, so I'm sure it doesn't matter. When this film was announced, everyone, and I mean everyone, was shitting on this for being possibly triggering or promoting or glamorizing eating disorders. It's just something they hated because it was fun to hate and you were supposed to hate it for no reason. To be fair, <laughs> The interviews and the trailers greatly contradicted each other. It's not about glamorizing, fetishizing, showing images that didn't need to be seen. It was about the story. 75 for butter. That's not breakfast. Neither is coffee. You do a lot of sit-ups. Potted under and potted under control. Film that would glamorize or encourage a disorder. Okay, so now let's actually get into the film. So we have the rich white girl who's actually kind of a rebel because her life is so hard and misunderstood. And we can assume she's been, within at least the first five minutes, has a chronic, long-lived eating disorder of some sort and is no newbie to the hospital and shrink life. Her parents are divorced. She's an artist in some sort. But they went with um, artist on paper this time to avoid the whole dancing slash ballet cliche. And then she goes and meets Markiplier's twin doctor that convinces her to do his bullshit therapy where she learns about herself, friendship, and most importantly, love. <laughs> it's amazing how this film manages to go downhill as it progresses. It starts off alright, but as it goes on, it gets worse and worse and worse. And so does the dialogue and the emotion and any sort of tension built up between the characters totally falls apart. There is one scene in the first couple minutes, I think, when she first gets discharged from the hospital between her and her stepmom, and it's really the only scene in the film that made me feel any sort of emotion. Okay. Turn towards me. Do you see that? Do you see what you look like? Yeah. Do you think that's beautiful? No. The mom purposely humiliated her daughter, put her on the spot, and then treated her as if Ellen was stupid and completely unaware of her own situation. She knows how she looks in the mirror. Even if she has body dysmorphia, she knows how people see her. Oh, and there is one other really good character, which is Megan, and she is the um, pregnant anorexic in recovery. But that's the end of the good things. Okay, so first, can we get this out of the way? And I know I cannot be the only one, but can we... Just talk about how annoying it was, the way that they tried to sexualize eating disorders and food. Like the opening scene where she's at home doing sit-ups on the floor and she sounds like she's about to have a fucking orgasm. <laughs> <laughs> then this guy over here and he just has food dripping out of his mouth and oh it's like God. really disgusting, oh really like off-putting. Oh like Another scene where he tries to entice her to eat chocolate, this this guilty pleasure food of hers. And they try to make it something very sexual and really awkward and creepy and gross, except for they're not alone. They have like a whole bunch of people sitting around them while she just moans as she breathes into this chocolate wrapper. It is a sex thing. Oh. Are you freak and then lastly there's a scene where they're at this Chinese restaurant and she's spitting her food back out oh yeah so good yeah mm. right? oh. swallow that egg roll Blech. is oh. it just me my second pet peeve are the stereotypes it was probably one of the first things I noticed right off the bat and I thought they were really strange especially coming from a Netflix film but with this it was just so obvious so she's in a unit with a lot of different people, but all the black people are rude, fat, comic relief characters. All the, or at least the majority of the white characters in here are blonde, skinny, they're ditzy, they're dumb. And what the heck is this nurse's problem? Pretty soon you're gonna be flopping around here like a boneless fish. Ooh, thanks. I feel so inspired to be healthy now. 
Oh, but I will give them this. The one boy that they decided to put in this unit is not gay. So congratulations on not filling out that stereotype. Beverly with Zombie Land. No way. Yeah. Emma Stone's kind of fat, don't you think? Well, no, I think she's just big bone. He's like at least a size six. Okay, so the third thing, which is my biggest problem with this film, is awful, awful kid. I don't even remember his name. He's the British boy. Um, I've repressed it somewhere in my brain. The dancer boy. Oh, oh, remember the whole thing I said about the cliche about her being an artist on paper? Scrap that. Our second main character, I just realized he's a dancer. He's he's a ballet dancer. Okay, so they, they did get it in there. Checklist. Okay, so the next big thing, the most annoying thing about this film, which no one seems to talk about, which I don't understand, this is so frustrating, is this relationship that they try to put between Ellen and this boy, and it was so forced and so fake and so toxic. It's so toxic. This is the definition of an abusive relationship. But this boy is so manipulative and controlling, and he uses guilt-tripping and shaming Ellen any second he can get in order to get her to do what he wants, or in order to get her to think the way he does, or in order for him to win an argument. So basically, he asks Ellen if she's ever been sexually abused or molested, and she hints that she has, but she kind of laughs it off. She really makes it obvious that she doesn't want to talk about it. But he pushes the conversation anyways, just so he can end it with the punchline, to where he confesses his feelings for her. Bruh. He literally forces himself on top of her the next minute after, after like, deli- So of course she gets pissed and tries to leave, but instead of owning up to his mistake, he then tries to make her the bad guy and guilt trip her into not wanting to have sex with him in the backyard. The public backyard. Right, it'd be like slapping two bags of bones together anyway. I didn't mean to unleash the cracker. There's another scene earlier on when Ellen first arrives at this institute, and she's kind of having a hard time. She hasn't quite got the ropes yet, and he shows up uninvited and starts policing her on her behaviors that day, on what she should and shouldn't do, and he goes on this tangent about how great and wonderful he is and how his path to recovery is so enlightening and how she should be more like him, and it's like, I don't think she's been here for more than 48 hours, and he's giving her a what for. So next, later on, I show these two going out to dinner, and he encourages her, a severe anorexic, to not only drink alcohol underage, but to get drunk. What? Like, this is so dangerous and irresponsible in so many ways, and I can't believe the film tried to make a joke out of this. They try to make this scene some funny, light-hearted, cute little romantic get-together dinner. Like, what are you gonna do if her liver shuts down? What if she just passes out because her tolerance is shit? She'll have the number 12 too with the egg roll. No. Yes. No. She'll what? have the number 12 too with the egg roll. Bite. I don't like egg rolls. Chew and spit if you want to be lame. And lastly, there's a scene near the film's climax where Ellen decides to leave the treatment center. Uh, Loverboy then comes on to her again all about his problems, and it's just me, 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 and I can't dance anymore, I'm permanently injured, yeah, I'm so sad, nobody cares about me, blah, blah, blah. Like, when she's like, no, I've, I've got to go, I've got my own stuff to sort out, he starts guilt-shaming her again for wanting to leave, without asking once if she's okay, or if she's having a problem, or if they should sit down and talk about it. She is not your therapist there to make you feel better, boy. She is a patient just like you are. Anything could have happened. She could have been kicked out for all you know. She could have ran out of money because that's what happens a lot of times. Maybe she made the smart decision and decided treatment there was not a good idea. Oh. But even though he did forget to ask her how she's feeling, he did not forget to recommend having some more alcohol again. Let's go get another cancer beer. Let's go on to my point five, which is the treatment center, and I don't want to talk too long about this because this part is rather subjective. I will say maybe some of you guys thought his teaching ways were innovative or amazing in some sort of way, but um, I, I, ba I thought it was basically just a bunch of lazy bullshit. His idea of recovery is putting a bunch of sufferers in a house 
where they decide whether they eat or not. They get all the decisions. They're unsupervised, so whether they eat is up to them, whether they vomit is up to them, whether they take laxatives, or... And, and their reasoning is like, oh, but you have to want it, so we're giving you the choice of freedom. The, di the difference is that you pay $1,000 a week for it here instead of at home. This is such a contradiction to the nature of eating disorders in general. The sufferers don't want change 99% of the time, or they don't have strong enough will in order to create a change. And then secondly, family therapy is kind of an extremely important thing, especially because even if you can get help at their hospital, as soon as you go back home, you're just being fed to the wolves again. But no, in the film, he banishes the idea of family therapy because he'd rather be all buddy-buddy with his patients. The, their family session is a total mess, and he just kind of sits back and lets, lets them all hash it out. Helps no one. And then he decides what she really needs is not is not family therapy. You don't need your family, but you need a name change. Out of the blue, for no reason, he decides she needs to change her name. What was it? Elliot? Ellie? Eli. That was her nickname, Eli. It's his idea and everything. He even comes up with the name himself. He doesn't even ask for her opinion. He just decided that he didn't like it. It was a bad name for her. It's holding you back. I'm it's not crazy about your name. What? Ellen doesn't suit you. It's too old-fashioned. I was thinking Ellie. Ooh. Eli. I mean, he's the good guy, remember? And I guess it worked, because now she thinks she's a new person. Ian Sorter is gone. That was, that was Ellen's problem. I'm Eli now. But his idea of daily therapy is just fucking around in general. When you're down, run in water, dance a little, laugh with some friends, swear and scream if you're if you really feel like it, but he never actually gives or teaches any of the patients here how to deal with their problems, particularly at night when they're all alone and by ourselves and the real demons come out to play. And then there's a scene at the end where Ellen actually trusts him enough to talk to him about some deep shit and the kind of stuff that makes having a therapist worth it. And what does he do? He shuts her off. He shuts her completely down when she tries to explain to him something's not working out and he gets very defensive and mean. This idea you have that there's a way to be safe, it's childish and cowardly. That's your pearl of wisdom? Grow a pair? Yeah. Now we're finally at my last point, we're getting to the end of here, which is where Ellen finally goes home to bum at her real mom's getaway ranch. And by the way, did I mention this? I guess the whole reason her parents divorced is because her dad's a dick and her mom's a lesbian and she got married to this other chick. So Ellen's mom, kind of really weird, and talks like she's just hit up a joint. But her wife is actually kind of cool. She's I liked her character a lot anyways. She's probably the most level-headed, insane person inside the whole film. And she winds up suggesting the idea of animal therapy, or animal care, with horses. So basically giving um, Ellen the opportunity to give her a new perspective and a new way of living from day to day, kind of break her old routine, which probably is what started the eating disorder in the first place. Which was kind of a really, a really good new and original approach to recovery, but they never touch on this subject ever again in the film. And then we get the strangest, most cringiest scene. Basically, Ellen's hippie mom gets this idea that she thinks it would be beneficial to Ellen that if she was to bottle feed her cradle style like a baby. And Ellen somehow agrees, I guess, for whatever god reason, and I don't understand what the point of this was. The mom was kind of coming off like it was going to rekindle their relationship, but the film set it up to where they make us think Ellen favors her real mom over her stepmom. Her stepmom is the one they're feuding with. And even if this is supposed to rekindle the relationship that was never really broken between them, it's not like it ever pays off at the end of the film because we never see these two characters together again, having any sort of conversation after this scene. We don't know if this moment changed anything in their lives. And then after the scene, it just cuts to the morning and Ellen goes on this random walk out in the mountains for no reason. She passes out, almost dies, and has this weird mirage, this stupid metaphorical premonition about life and death, and when she wakes up, she suddenly is reborn again. She wants recovery. She wants to live. So the film then ends with Ellen returning back to that abusive and manipulative treatment center, and they all live happily ever after. The end. <laughs>